Hi, this is Greg, and thanks for checking out this video. I've invited Paul Thornton, a recognized leadership influencer, to come on my channel and discuss his latest book, Performance Management for New Managers. Hit the ground running, it says. And I was very pleased to get this copy through Amazon.com. Last September, we also interviewed Paul about a previous book that he wrote, The Leadership Process. Are you effective at each step of the leadership process? I highly recommend this book as well as his latest. I'll put a link to this, by the way, in the comments area, the interview that I did with Paul last September. I've known Paul for over 20 years, and his entire career has been focused on management and leadership development. He's a prolific author, consultant, trainer. He's presented numerous seminars and workshops. Paul is also a former professor of business administration, and I'm pleased, very pleased to have him with us today. In today's video, we're going to discuss his latest book, and we're going to share our thoughts on a number of leadership topics. Again, I want to uh, make sure everyone gets a good look at this book. It's a great read, and I encourage you certainly uh, to buy it. It's, uh, it's a very interesting book, and he brought some things out that I hadn't even considered myself, particularly in establishing goals. And that's one of the things that I focus on uh, quite a bit with my clients. So I hope you enjoy the video today. Let me know in the comment area if you would like future videos like this interview. I first came in contact with Paul in February of 2002. I did an interview with him for We Lead Online Magazine. And I just want to, before I forget, I want to mention that We Lead has had a major upgrade after being kind of uh, absent and sleepy for a number of years. We just invested in an incredible upgrade. So if you have articles that you would like to submit and you're watching this video and you, you have a management or leadership oriented article, be sure to go to leadingtoday.org and you'll see on the site a, a menu that says contribute. And when you drop down that menu, it will tell you how you can submit an article. And I encourage everyone to do so. We have totally renovated and upgraded the site for 2023. We're very proud of it. And I hope uh, when after you see this uh, YouTube video today that you'll go to leadingtoday.org and check out our new site. And the first article I think I received from Paul was entitled Leadership, Seeing, Describing, and Pursuing What's Possible. So that Paul may remember that, and that's also been mm -hmm. reported on the new leadingtoday.org site, as a number of his other articles are. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a great article, and I'm very mm -hmm. pleased here to discuss today his new book, Performance management for new managers hit the ground running. So, Paul, uh, what is the performance management process? Well, first of all, Greg, thank you again for having me on. Yeah. I deeply appreciate it, and I deeply appreciate all you've done to help uh, elevate people's leadership skills and management skills. And uh, I will be going to your new upgraded website as soon as we <laughs> conclude our discussion today. Okay. So performance management, um, you know, we might think of it as managing performance. I mean, uh -huh. it's all of the actions that managers take to work with and through their people. You know, what they do yeah. to get their people to complete tasks, get things done. Uh, develop their skills, you know, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So regarding the process in the first section of the book, you mentioned three mm -hmm. priorities as part of the performance management process. Can you give mm -hmm. us a brief mention of these three priorities? Yeah, I think there's uh, three things any leader needs to do, any manager needs to do. Number one, you got to manage yourself. You know, we've, we've all heard that before, but that's really important. You set the example, you set the tone. So that's number one. Number two, you have to manage your boss. Your boss controls the resources you get to do your job. The equipment, the money, the budget, the people, you know, the information. So 
you got to have a good relationship with your boss. So manage your boss. And then number three is manage your direct reports. And that involves all of the steps in the performance management process, like setting goals, giving feedback, et cetera. So those three things I think are good to keep in mm -hmm. mind as you start your journey managing a group of people. Start with yourself, then your boss, then your direct reports. Paul, I really love your uh, phrase of manage your boss. That's something I haven't heard very yeah. often before. And I assume when you use that phrase, you mean have a positive relationship with your boss, know what your boss wants out of you, and mm -hmm. uh, work hard to fulfill the, the needs and the expectations of your boss. And do I kind of mm -hmm. get that? To... Yeah, that's exactly right, Greg. Um, it's really not so much managing your boss, but building a positive relationship with your boss. So you will be able to influence him or her to get the resources you need to do your mm -hmm. job. Yeah, yeah, that's a better way of saying it. Okay, wonderful. What inspired you to write the book? Well, I I enjoy writing. I'm always writing something, articles or mm -hmm. uh, something. So I, you know, I, I still keep hearing about a lot of people who are promoted to be being a manager, and they receive very little guidance or very little training. And I know there's a lot of books out there on this topic, but I'm always trying to come up with a way to simplify it, to boil it down to the nitty gritty uh, actions managers will take. So it was my stab at coming up with something very simple, very clear, very actionable to help people be better managers or be mm -hmm. effective managers, you know? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. This is the, my next question here is the one that um, I really hadn't thought about deeply that I that really it, it was worth the price of admission just reading what you <laughs> had to say about establishing goals. You mentioned three approaches to establish, yeah. establishing goals. And can you enlighten us on those three approaches? Again, it's a whole sure. perspective that I hadn't even thought of before. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think. Like, Greg, if you worked for me, if I was your boss, mm -hmm. your manager, I could, one approach I could use, I could say, Greg, here are your goals for the next six months. You know, look them mm -hmm. over. That's what you got to get done. Here are the deadlines, et cetera. So here you go. Right. That's one approach. You tell the person what they need to do. The second approach is have a discussion. So I could say, Greg, what do you think your goal should be regarding sales or quality or whatever it might be? So we would have a discussion about it. I'd get your thoughts, your ideas. Eventually, we need to get clear and boil them down to, OK, let's agree on this is the goal then that we've, we've both discussed mm -hmm. and come to agreement on. Or I could say to you, Greg, I want you to take the next day and think about what goals you want to pursue or what you think the goals that are needed for the next six months. So you go off on your own and think about that and let's meet tomorrow. And I want to hear what you come up with. So I'm really delegating to the person that I want them to on their own, come up with what they think the appropriate goals would be for the next six months. Now, tomorrow, when we get together, we are going to have a little discussion about them and, I may be in total agreement and say, perfect, you, you know, you nailed it. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I had in mind as well. Or I might say, let's talk about this one. Uh, I really think you need to do X, Y, Z. And we'd have a little discussion and what have you. So it's a combination of styles there. But in essence, I think you can do three things. You can tell the person. You can have a discussion and ask them questions about the goals that should be mm -hmm. set. Or you can delegate and have them come up with their goals and then discuss it. So that those so Paul, are kind of the three approaches yeah. you can use. Again, I found that very enlightening. Would um, you say that one of those approaches is better than others, or does it depend on the situation and the manager relationship with the person that they're working with? I think it depends on the person you're working with. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think their experience level and um, 
their knowledge of the tasks that they have to get done and how long they've been working in a particular job. You know, so there's a variety of factors I think you can um, consider. Um, mm -hmm. I think you can use a combination of these things too. You could say, you know, here's two things you, you must get done and describe them and tell them this is what it is. But let's talk mm -hmm. about this third goal and let's have a discussion because I want to hear your thoughts and ideas and, and that type of thing. And going even further, I could say, okay, but in these two areas, I want you to go off on your own and come up with what you think would be appropriate. So a combo approach is a possible too. But mm -hmm. I think managers always need to be thinking about what is best to help the person, uh, involve the person, engage the person, get their commitment to it. The more say the person has in their goals, the more committed they're going to be, I think. So sure. getting Absolutely. them to have some say in it is a mm -hmm. good thing. You yeah, know? you're going to get a greater degree of buy-in. Yeah, buy-in like, is great. Uh, yeah, yep. sure. Yep, yep. In Chapter 3, which I think is entitled Taking Action, you mentioned mm -hmm. some fears that people encounter that inhibit employees from taking action. And I can tell you, the older I get, the more I realize just how people are motivated by fear, particularly in the workplace. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe that's because of the pandemic that brought it even to a greater degree of people living in fear of being with other people or all working in the same building. I'm not sure what it is, but I've noticed what I think is an uptake uh, in the fear level that people seem to have in the business world. Can you expand on uh, these fears that people encounter that stop them from doing the things they need to do, from taking action? Yeah, I, I think fear is, you know, of course, again, it varies person to person, as we all know. But fear of looking bad, fear of making a mistake, uh, fear that your peer group is going to look down on the approach you used. Mm -hmm. uh, fear can really hold us back. So I think you need to diagnose your fears, you know, dig into them, reflect on them, unravel them, if you will, and, uh, you know, figure them out. What What is, why do you have that fear and what do you need to do to, get over it and get beyond it, you know, and sometimes mm -hmm. people need a counselor to help them or a therapist to help them work through those fears. But anytime, any fear we have is going to hold us back to some extent. So the more we can, mm -hmm. you know, get in touch with those and get to the root cause of the fear and then resolve it, the better off we're going to be. So e easier said than done, Greg, as you know, but uh, sure. That's really what you got to do. So how does our uh, self-talk relate to this? I've, I'm a fan of uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, who's often on mm -hmm. PBS, and he yeah. uh, specializes in the brain. And he talks about uh, self-talk and how it makes us fearful all the time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, he emphasizes the fact that uh, we need to stamp out the ants that are in our head, the automatic negative thoughts, which oftentimes yeah. are generated by our own self-talk. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been said that 80% uh, of what we think and ponder eventually degenerates into negativity when we dwell mm -hmm. on it for a period of mm -hmm. time. Uh, yeah. So obviously the, our self-talk can uh, con, and the reason I say con is they find that a lot of self-talk frankly, is not true when they think that a, mm. a major epiphany can occur when we mm. begin to challenge our self-talk, when we have a negative feeling about another person and maybe we don't even know them that well, rather than, rather mm. than just buying it and accepting it, because after all, it's me talking to me. I wouldn't lie to myself, would I? Oh, I'd lie mm. to myself all the mm. time. So, yeah. the, you know, a lot of therapists are emphasizing uh, challenge your self-talk. If if it says something that is highly emotional, if it's judgmental, if uh, if it's unfair or unkind, just don't accept it as the way you are, but have the courage to challenge that self-talk. So having said that, 
uh, how much do you think the self-talk that we all have is related to the fear of taking action? I, I think it's uh, very much related. Um, I think we, like you said, Greg, we engage in a lot of self-talk and some of it we kind of mindlessly just <laughs> accept yeah. and really yeah. don't think about. It just kind of flows through our, our mind. Right. Um, and I think you're right. We need to become more aware of what we're saying to ourselves and what stories we're telling ourselves and things like that. And some of it just isn't true, as, as we well know. So challenging it, um, reflecting on it, correcting it, if it's not true or it's definitely outlandish, uh, correcting it. Um, making assumptions. Sometimes we make assumptions about mm -hmm. people and, and things like that, and that influences our self-talk. And the assumption may be so false and so inaccurate that it's silly, but somehow we start to believe it because we've said it to ourselves 10 times, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, being more self-aware, uh, questioning your self-talk, analyzing it, and correcting what's faulty or inaccurate, I think is really important. Sure. I, I would agree with you, Paul. And I, yeah. I, if we're not challenging it, obviously, we're never going to correct it. If we don't right. challenge it, we'll just assume that it's true uh, right. and that it's right. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think, again, that's why um, there's a major change in our thinking when we understand that our self-talk indeed can lie to us mm -hmm. and that we You're have right. to seize control and be willing yep. to challenge it uh, when it yep. uh, degenerates into some form of negativity. Mm -hmm. I In think on that, five, Greg, yeah. let, let me just add one other point on sure, that. Sure, you I bet. Absolutely. Some people, um, you know, have used positive affirmations and I think those can be dangerous also. Um, People say to themselves, you know, I'm the greatest salesman that ever <laughs> lived, you know, yeah. and, and they say these things over and over to themselves and they start to believe it. Well, it's not true. It's not accurate. I mean, that's a danger mm -hmm. also. OK, so mm -hmm. you got you got to be really clear on what exactly are you saying to yourself? and correcting not only the negative things, but some of these positive exaggerations that really aren't accurate or true, you know? Yeah, that's um, especially I could say to myself, I'm the greatest tennis player that ever played, and I could say that <laughs> over and over. Well, it's it's just not true, you know? <laughs> it is I wish I were, walk on it's the not true. Court. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, good point. So I guess Thank it works both yeah. ways is what I'm trying to say. Sure, gotcha. You know? In chapter five, and I think that it might be uh, entitled coaching or you discuss coaching in yeah. chapter five, you emphasize the importance of encouraging employees to coach themselves. And this may also tie in to self-talk a little bit. What are some mm -hmm. of the tools uh, the employee can use to do this? Obviously, not positive self-affirmations. I'm the greatest mm -hmm. employee that ever was, or I don't need to change, or, right? But what are some of the realistic tools an employee can use to coach themselves? Well, I think it starts with becoming more aware of what you're saying and doing uh -huh. and what impact that is having on the other person. And then deciding what can I, what tweak or change can I make in my approach that might be more effective uh, I mentioned in the book that I watch a lot of tennis on uh, TV and mm -hmm. certain tennis players that are good at diagnosing how they're playing in the opponent they're playing. And then they're able to make little adjustments to their game to make, you know, to improve their game. Right. And I think uh, we need to do the same thing in business as a manager. If I'm not, you know, connecting with a person or getting through I need to be aware of that and I need to think, okay, what what different approach should I use? Should I ask more questions? Should I, um, I don't know, should I delegate more? What, what should I do differently? Should I 
um, follow up with better questions. Mm -hmm. So what do I need to do to connect better or engage the person better, that type of thing. And it's, you know, it's not something you learn overnight, but it's something that gradually you get better and better at it and more aware of what's going on. And uh, you can make quicker adjustments and make a faster impact and be more positive. So that's kind of the way I look at it. All right. It sounds to me like the theme maybe of a, a future book for a particular prolific <laughs> author <laughs> that I know. So uh, I, I just find that very interesting and yeah. uh, good. Now in the next chapter, uh, you discuss a disciplinary action and it's an interesting topic because mm. most managers I know of hate anything regarding mm. disciplinary action. They hate to do it. They hate to have the conversation. It's a difficult conversation and you mm -hmm. comment, and I'm going to quote you from your book. You say, taking disciplinary action is an example of tough love. It shows you mm -hmm. care about the person and believe they are capable of doing more. Uh, end of mm -hmm. quote. Uh, yet mm -hmm. many managers that, and from my experiences, they totally deflate their fellow workers by their approach to disciplinary mm -hmm. action. Sometimes it precipitates a good employee if it's mishandled to begin looking for another job because they've just been, mm. they feel like they've been so belittled or mm. criticized or uh, because there was no mention of anything that they do good. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. They're just totally deflated. And mm. uh, for some people it's the turning point of them mm. going out and finding another job. Now, if it's a mediocre employee, maybe that's not so bad, but if it's a mm. really good employee and it's mishandled, um, yeah, I think it can cause problems and, and has proven to cause problems if the disciplinary action is harsh. Um, mm. So where do we find the balance? How do we um, how do we give disciplinary <clears throat> action with the tough love and show that person that we care about them without just totally uh, destroying their mm. uh, sense of self-worth or their value uh, to the company? I, I think what I've seen mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes when a manager needs to give someone difficult feedback or they need to discipline disciplinary action, uh, the manager themselves is quite angry over something, you know, some performance shortfall of the employee, they didn't get something done. So the manager's angry. And their uh -huh. anger comes out in the way they interact with the employee. So one thing I always uh, taught my students and managers is drop the anger before you have your discussion with the employee. Uh, good point. You need to be in a good mental state, a good, uh -huh. good spot before you have the discussion. Your goal as a manager is to help people perform at their best, to help them improve. So you're taking this action to make them aware that their current performance isn't getting it done and they gotta make some changes. And again, you could tell the person what changes they need to make or you uh -huh. can have a discussion or you could delegate. You could use any one of those three styles again. Um, but dropping your anger I think is big and, and having the framework or mental model that I'm really, I really wanna help this person. So. All of my comments and all of my um, statements and, and action items I'm going to do uh, or say to the person need to be in that direction. And sometimes the a good question to ask is, you know, what can I do to help you improve your performance? You know, that that can sure. be useful. And sometimes the employee will say something you didn't even realize you were doing exactly. or not doing, you know, right? Right, so, right. That can be useful. But my big message, I guess, would be drop your anger, get in a good space before you have the discussion. Mm -hmm. And it'll go a lot better if you're in a good uh, spot. Yeah. Great. You, you remind me something that I've uh, taught my clients for years. And that is when you come to the point where you need to do some disciplinary action, mm -hmm. I encourage them to use what I call a praise sandwich. 
And that basically is you, you don't start out the conversation just jumping into some fault or deficiency they have. You start mm-hmm. out the conversation by telling them some of the good things that they do, that they, the things that they add value to as an employee and in letting them know by that that you love them and that you appreciate the good things that that they do. Then in the center, after that, a few minutes of that discussion, then you get into the disciplinary action and the the change that needs to be done and the conversation, Mm -hmm. like you mentioned, how can I help? And you you get to the nitty gritty of, of discussing the disciplinary action that needs to be taken. But you don't end the conversation just on that negative note. Uh, You end up the conversation once again, letting them know that they're a person of value to the company. And this is something they certainly need to work on. But you also acknowledge that they show up on time, um, you know, that the reports are timely, that the uh, communication they do is well and et cetera. So basically what you're doing is you're in the middle, you're sandwiching um, the performance and their need for disciplinary action, your need to get them to do something better and different uh, while uh, prefacing it with something encouraging and ending it with something encouraging. And that way, uh, they sense that you genuinely care about them and you're just mm-hmm. not sitting down and making it a chew-out session and pointing out mm-hmm. all of their faults and all of their problems. Mm-hmm. So I found that um, a comment that you had uh, in the discussion on disciplinary action very, very helpful. Mm. I want to tie this together in chapter seven. You discuss conducting performance appraisals and how much of this, if any, should be corrected. Something American business did for a long time that um, I always thought was terrible is they did the so-called annual review, which was a combination of performance appraisal, um, disciplinary action, and an announcement of what your raise would be for the next year, <laughs> all in some document or some silly 10 minute meeting. And I, you know, I always railed against those because I thought they were worthless and yeah. they didn't contribute anything to an employee's growth. And pretty soon it just became something else in the manager's checklist that they dreaded. Mm-hmm. They had to do one a year for all of the people that work with them. Um, so having said all that, um, you discuss performance appraisal in Chapter 7. How much, of any, of it should be corrective? Is, and is it also a good time to discuss the disciplinary action if it happens to be needed? I, I think as a manager, if you've mm-hmm. done a good job all year long, you've given the person praise and recognition as mm-hmm. well as coaching, on what they need to do to improve. So you've, you've had a, a good series of interactions and the person has good clarity on their strengths and areas needing improvement. Mm-hmm. So the performance appraisal to me is sort of like the report card. It's sort of the summary of all the, you know, 38 discussions you've had throughout the year Right. And you're just kind of documenting that, you know, this is what you accomplished. These are your strengths. This is what you developed. And there could be some in the, in the written part, as we agreed, you're going to work on developing your writing skills and you're going to do X, Y, Z. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's a good summary. I never would recommend getting into any disciplinary action in the performance appraisal that should be totally separate and should be very specific for something the person needs to, to work on and improve. Um, right. So, yeah, I, I don't think mm-hmm. I would not, I agree with you, Greg, that should not be included in the performance appraisal. That's not a good mm-hmm. idea. Right. You know? but, sure. but I also think a lot of times um, people in an appraisal, you might cover, you know, 10 things they've done really well and how they've improved something and uh, skills they've acquired and what have you. Mm-hmm. You might discuss one improvement opportunity and some people walk away and they focus totally on the one improvement opportunity, you know, 
Um, mm -hmm. A friend says, how'd it go? And, wow, geez, they talk, just talked about this thing I got to improve on. And, you know, it's all <laughs> negative from the employee's point of view. So yeah. I like the idea of asking the employee to summarize or to list the key points, the key messages that we've had in the discussion. I want to make sure the employee understands that, you know, we, we covered nine things they're doing really great at and they're really hitting home runs and they're, you know, adding value. And I want them to get that. And, and oh, yeah, by the way, like all of us, here's one thing you got to improve on. Mm -hmm. And I also mm -hmm. said in that chapter that I think one thing every manager should ask their employee is what can I do to help you improve? You know, what can I do to help you get better in, in doing your job? And again, they may say, no, it's fine. Or they might come up with some little yeah. suggestion you hadn't even thought about, you know. And mm -hmm. that's what we all as managers need to be thinking about. How do I get better? How do I influence my employee more so they're more productive, more effective and, you know, that type of thing. So I think that's a good question to discuss as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, Paul, I believe you are the author of 21 or 22 books. I can't keep up with them. Uh, you're a very <laughs> prolific writer. Uh, yeah. You have over 100 articles published in mm -hmm. a number of leadership and management magazines, including We Lead Online Magazine mm -hmm. and in journals uh, and in various websites. Your articles uh, show up and you comment. I can vouch for the fact that he comments daily on LinkedIn uh, mm. He's a really good communicator, and that's mm. really uh, fantastic. So with all that you do, and I know that you're a retired professor, uh, mm. what's next? What's next on your list? Well, I, I, I enjoy writing, as I said earlier. Um, writing, to me, helps clarify my, my thinking, and then my mm -hmm. thinking helps me write better. So it's a reciprocal sure. arrangement there. So I think that's good. Um, I did write another book this recently, and it was ah. on leadership, leadership development for students. Yes, I saw that on LinkedIn. Better. Yeah, I saw a picture high, of it. Yeah. High school students and college students. So one of my grandsons um, is a freshman in high school going into his second year. So I think my next little project is going to be to work with him, have him mm -hmm. read the book and work on his leadership skills and uh, see how what he thinks of the book and how right. he thinks it may or may not help him be a more effective leader. So excellent. I'm, working yeah. on that. I'm also working on an article on uh, effective teams. I know there's a lot of material out there mm -hmm. on that, but um, I'm tr again, I'm all my writing. I try to simplify and clarify what does a team leader need to do to mm -hmm. produce a great team? So that's uh, kicking around as well. So that's yeah. what I'm working on. Yeah. All right, great. It's always- uh, How about you? What are you working on? I have been working on a number of YouTube sites. And the, yeah. the one that I've emphasized the most is Leadership Excellence, where mm -hmm. this will be posted. And I'm very mm -hmm. close to being monetized, I'm pleased mm -hmm. to say, which means- that when YouTube shows an advertisement before a video, I will receive mm -hmm. a little bit of a slice of the Great. ad Great. revenue. Great. And Great. Uh, I'm also thinking of maybe some um, promotional material on it, maybe hats or T-shirts that are leadership oriented, uh, something mm -hmm. of that nature and expanding that. But I've been putting a lot of focus on uh, the YouTube site. And of course, my regular consulting and coaching business is very healthy. And uh, mm -hmm. I have just about all the work I can handle there. So mm -hmm. uh, that's that's kind of uh, kind of what I've been doing. Good. good. That's that's exciting. It's exciting. It is. Yeah. Now, I know that you do professional training for groups and organizations, and mm -hmm. I may have totally messed this up, but I thought for sure that on LinkedIn, I saw something from you in which you mentioned that you actually had an international training event that was coming up this year. Did I see that correctly or no, am I you, losing you, it? You did see that. <laughs> I am um, I am Great. speaking at a Tell us conference about it. 
in Barcelona, Spain. Ah, and, great. And I'm speaking on the topic of alignment, organizational alignment, which is something that I think is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I'm doing that. And um, my last training program, I did a training program in Dubai. And that That's was right. a I remember that. experience uh -huh. to go to Dubai and to see how the managers and leaders there think and their approach to uh, problems and issues and opportunities. So that was, a. I I learned, I'm sure, more than my mm -hmm. students learned in that little seminar workshop. There was, I don't know, 17 or 18 people involved. So it was yeah. great fun, great experience. Yeah. Well, you prompted me to ask a question and that is, uh, how are the managers or leaders in Dubai any different than that you would find maybe in the Western world because of the influence we have in the West? Did you notice anything different about the I, way I that did. they lead? Yeah, I did. One one big difference. They were implementing a new performance management system in their company. Now, in the States, if mm -hmm. we were doing that here at a company, my boss would have said to me, I want you to work on this and implement it. And I want it up and running in the next six months or three mm -hmm. months, you know, be a sh shorter time frame. In Dubai, they're very much uh, focused on getting everyone comfortable with the new approach. And they want the managers to buy into it and they want to discuss mm. it and plan it and what have you, they yeah. will take probably two years to implement their new performance management program. Interesting. And, and why is it going to take that long? Because they will not move forward on it until everyone is comfortable and they have buy-in and they've received some training and they're, mm. they're for it and, you know, they're, they're, they're behind it. So that that to me was a huge difference. I was just mm -hmm. shocked at their approach and how willing they are to take their time and go slow, you know? Whereas in the States, we're very impatient. We want things ASAP and we want it done, you know, tomorrow. Yeah. You know, it's uh, so Yeah, different. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's but fascinating. In, in many other areas, mm -hmm. they were the same i mean they're again managing a group of people and they got to set goals and motivate them and give them feedback and um all those things so many of the traditional things that managers and leaders do they're they're confronted with the same issues day in and day out you know so yeah yeah so i'm just curious whether it's international or you're doing some training here in the states mm -hmm. what's the most popular topics or issues that people want you to discuss i think delegate well generally i discuss mm -hmm. leadership styles which are the three i mentioned earlier right uh leadership process uh performance management which we discussed today and uh alignment now those happen to be like four of the major topics that i've done a lot of writing and reading and research and mm -hmm. preparation on so those are kind of the four that i i do on a regular basis but i think the topic of delegation is always something people are you know mm -hmm. they want to know more how to delegate better that type of thing communication skills is always an issue um motivating people often is a common topic you know what can i do to motivate this one and that one and mm -hmm. things like that uh dealing with problem employees you know everyone's got a, that sure. problem employee and it's like what do i do to motivate this person or what do i do mm -hmm. to help them change or you know and, and i guess right. the last yeah. one would be just dealing with the ever changing priorities that occur in their company, you know, the constant shifting of what's most important and how do you, you know, manage that? How do you deal with it? And how do you stay above all the noise that's happening day mm -hmm. in and day out? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, that's yeah. an important one. I'm sure, I'm sure you see many of the same issues with your clients as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I had one employee yeah. tell me, 
that he was frustrated by the uh, the knee jerk uh, change of the month club that he called yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. it seems like every month there's some new initiative. Uh, and yeah. first we were all running to the left. Now we're all told to run to the right, mm. and it mm. gets very very frustrating for people working mm -hmm. in that kind of an environment. Mm -hmm. I was reading about one company that had 18 different change initiatives going on at the same time. Employees were so stressed, so frustrated. They didn't know what was important. And it just right. was unraveling very quickly, you know? Yeah. And that's a classic example of the lack of leadership within mm. an organization yeah. that yeah. allowed, that has allowed and fostered that to even right. occur in the organization. Yep. Yep, so, Paul, what's the best way for someone to contact you if they would like you to do some training for them or um, help them in some way? What's the best way for someone to contact you regarding a seminar or workshop or training or anything else that uh, falls within your expertise? Uh, probably the best way or the best way is just simply to email me. My email okay. is pbthornton74 at gmail.com. So that's Great. probably the easiest way. Okay. And I'll be sure to put that in the comments area. Okay. It'll have Great. a link so uh, people uh, can easily locate you uh, if, if they want. And again, I want to uh, highly recommend uh, Paul's book here, Performance Management for New Managers. Hit the ground running, it says. And it is his 21st or 22nd book. Again, I can't keep up with them all, but it's a great read. I enjoyed reading it. And Paul, it has been, as always, an absolute pleasure to have you on our channel today. And thank you very much for your insight, for your wisdom. And I hope you'll come back in the future after you write uh, another book and we can talk about a few more things at that time. Thanks, Greg. I always appreciate your support. Uh, be a leader, make a difference as you always do. So keep at it and keep going. So thank you again. Thank you, Paul.